Who in Metro Church, you having a great day already? There's something about being in God's presence. That worship was rich, but I'll tell you, we've already had an amazing weekend. We had this place pretty full yesterday for a marriage workshop that we did with Pastors Richard and Gail Barron Chief. I'll tell you, it's the first time ever that we had 100% turnouts for 100% registration. How many think that is insane and exciting? And uh, we left with just a bunch of great godly wisdom on how to better marriages. And we had people there that hadn't yet been married, but they go, when I do get married, I want to get it right. How many think that's smart? Prudence is our ally, isn't it? Isn't it? And today, I want to give him as much time as I can, but I need to let you know just how special pastors Richard and Gail are to us as Metro Church family. Actually, for those that remember, six years ago to this date, Pastor Richard stood here and did the passing of the baton for the transition of our founding pastors to Pastor Julie and I on the 18th of September, six years ago. He has been part of the family. Gail has as well. And this is the first time we've been able to see Gail back in almost a decade. And it's been amazing to spend the time, but for you to pour into us as well yesterday. Um, for those that aren't aware, Pastor Richard and I, we God has just opened amazing doors. We travel together. We'll be preaching at a conference in Accra, Ghana in October together. And God just continues to open doors. But I ask that you would open your heart for the word that's going to come from this van right now. Would you please put your hands together for Pastor Richard Parenchief as he comes and brings the word. Hey, that wasn't, that wasn't easy. He's so skinny now, I can lift him up. Anyway, it is a joy to be back here at Metro Church. We love you so much. And I just want to give honor to pastors. Um, you know, every so often you have divine connections in the body of Christ that you know are lifetime friendships. And I'll say this, you know, we've been in ministry now 35 years next month. 32 years pastoring the church we started. And um, you only get maybe a handful of those relationships in a lifetime, especially in ministry. And Pastors Chad and Julie Braswell are that to us. They are divine connections. Uh, sometimes I feel like Batman, but I have to have Robin. Sometimes he just, I'm, I, you know, sometimes he plays Batman and I have to be Robin. But anyway, no. It's just, it's just funny because we help each other in the nations. Um, there's, I've traveled the world. Um, when we get to Accra, Ghana, that'll be on my 79th country. And I think we've been, how many together have we been to? Over 20, right? And we've just been invited. Listen to this. Wait, hang on, hang on. We've just been invited this week for February to go to Macedonia, which is in the book of Acts. And I know geography, but I didn't even know the capital of Macedonia. Skopje. We're going to Skopje in February, God willing. So anyway, I just want to honor them. And I want to tell you that Pastor Julie is so special to us as well. And I want to honor Riley and Mackenzie. Uh, I've known these little girls since they, since they were little. And, uh, and now all of a sudden they've kind of grown up with our grandkids a little bit and are friends with our grandchildren in Florida. And it's just a great family relationship. You have great leaders. The world sees it. I hope you don't miss it. Thank you for that overwhelming response. <laughs> a prophet is not with honor, honor except in his own hometown sometimes. You need to give it up for your pastors one more time. <clears throat> speaking, of, speaking of grandkids, uh, I just have a little picture because everybody wants to know uh, progress of our grandkids and what's going on sometimes if you know me from the past. This is our five and uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Uh, anyway, it's a five-fold ministry. Anyway, Cole, our oldest grandson, just turned 13, which is crazy to me. And then he has a little sister who just turned two, little Kylan. So this is our daughter and our son-in-law's kids. They're Kennedys. And then we have uh, Mila and Alana, and they're parent chiefs. That's our son and daughter-in-law's kids, and just beautiful. So anyway, for me, give it up for them. Anyway, so anyway, it makes me feel good to show you our precious treasures today we don't usually do this, but today is Caden's eighth birthday, and we got special dispensation to be able to come today because we usually don't miss birthdays to go preach anywhere, but this is a special day. When I get right into the Word, um, have you ever had something that you really just felt you're supposed to do in your life, 
and for some reason it's just blocked. You just Every time you get towards it, something happens to kind of put it off. I, I want to talk about, uh, my message is called Dream On. Dream On. It's so many dreams have been switched to off or wait. And I feel like God is saying prophetically to the body of Christ, it's time to dream, turn your dream on. I call it Living the Unstuck Life, which was the title, is the title of my new book. Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to begin. I'm going to weave in Genesis 37. Luke 5, verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them. Please, please pay attention to that. The fishermen weren't in the boats. They had gone from them and were washing their nets. One translation says mending their nets. They were fixing broken nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. I read an interesting, uh, someone gave me a really cool um, Bible study, word for word, from Greek, Hebrew. It's called the Mirror Translation. It's from South Africa. And I was looking at this passage. It says this. That, that when Peter said master, that the literal translation, translation there is he's basically saying, okay, you're the captain of my boat now. Okay, captain. All right, master. We've done this, and we haven't caught anything, but because you said so, you're the skipper. Aye, aye. And he launched out. Why don't we even Genesis 37, verse 5? It says, now Joseph had a dream. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Let's pray one more time. Father, would you give us the spirit of wisdom, revelation? Holy Spirit, I need you to help me to deliver this message, to bring forth your word and power in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I haven't been here in about three years, and I wonder if anything's happened uh, here in the last three years. Um, the whole world's gone nuts. Stuff that was foundational, that we thought was pretty solid, was exposed to be pretty weak, anything built on sinking sand. <clears throat> it's been crazy. And many people have chosen to retreat into their homes, hearts, and lives, hiding out, trying to find a safe place where they can, you know, when, when we have hurricanes off the coast, like one was one in Puerto Rico right now, headed toward Dominican Republic today. In Florida, we have this thing called hunker down. Hunker down, something on the way. Hunker down. Well, there's a hunker down mentality in the body of Christ, and we thought it was going to be till the danger passes, but the problem is what I see is that there's still a problem right now where people are hunkering down post-COVID, retreating to inside themselves. I call it bunker mentality. Some see a church or see the church as a monastery when it's supposed to be an embassy. Foolish arguments over masks, no masks, vaccine, no vaccine, supply chain, economic, all this stuff don't mean anything compared to the church being the church, that we're supposed to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're supposed to set the example. The problem is if we're hiding, then the whole world is in a mess. There, you know, in a, in a, in a crisis mode, there, there is always a a circle the wagons mentality. We go into survival mode. I'm here to tell you and to remind you, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. We're not in survival mode. The, the, the emergency is passed. You can still do whatever you want to with vaccines, masks, whatever you want to do. It's free, you know, you're, it's a free country or it used to be. You need to get a hold of yourself and say, God, what do you have for me? What am I supposed to do? I, gotta, I want to be careful, but I don't want to be afraid. I want to do what God has called me to do, and I don't want to get caught up in all the arguments of the world and, to, and, and establish this bunker mentality. We're not called to live in circle the wagons. We're called to get on the road again, to get moving. And the problem is religious attitudes, religious mindsets, and by that I'm talking about traditional 
religious concepts make us satisfied with the status quo, and that is the enemy of your life. I told the, uh, the couples yesterday, that's the enemy of your life. If you're not growing, you're shrinking. If you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. There's no such thing in the kingdom of God as sitting still. It's not true. It's not real. It's an illusion, and so we've got to keep moving. In one of his most perilous times, young David, before he was king, retreated into a cave called Adullam and attracted a few hundred men who were described as distressed, indebted, and discontented. Doesn't that sound like the world right now? Distressed, indebted, and discontented. And I, and, 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 and people, listen, we run into a cave. Why? Because misery loves company. That's not in the Bible, but it may be, maybe it's a principle. But misery loves company. When you, when you, get, when you go through something, you just want to be with other people that are going through something. The amazing thing about the cave of Adullam, David had come in there from a place where he was acting like he was insane to try to save his own life. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was transformed in that cave and reshaped that ragtag bunch into the mighty men of valor. He transformed them. Ladies and gentlemen, that's church. That's church. We're being transformed. We're being changed in the image of Jesus. We're changed. We're taking on another another form. We're, we're you know, if you remember any of your science classes, and I don't remember much, but it was it's you know it, like a caterpillar, the pupa cocoons goes through a metamorphosis. It's a worm that becomes a chrysalis, a hard shell, developing wings, and emerging as a beautiful butterfly in the right time. And I think a whole lot of people have been through a lot of pupa seasons. But in the dark, in the loneliness, in those, in those months of lockdown, we found out who we were and who we weren't. We found out how much we needed God. Even people that don't know him didn't recognize him. We found out, and we found out he's faithful. We found out he's faithful in the middle of it. He's faithful when nobody else can help you, when nobody else can provide for you, when when when. People are arguing over this, that, the other thing, left, right, back, forth, whatever. God was faithful. He is faithful. He will be faithful. And if he'll take care of you then, what will, in what place can he not take care of you and me? He's worthy. He's, he's worthy of worship. He's worthy of praise, not because we sing songs to him, but because he, in those moments in the cave, God showed he was God again. And he showed it to us. He's shown it to us many times. If you if you're if you've been you know around for a few decades like I have, you know. I mean, I was I was so enjoying the worship because I, I don't know the brother's name up here on the Les Paul, Gary, Gary. I, Gary's probably my age, maybe right around my age, but I I don't know. I could see him rocking out with long hair sometime. I don't know if that ever happened. I could just see Gary as a rock and roll guy. And I don't know if that's true, but I just had this image, and it just took me back to my days. I used to be a bass player in a rock and roll band, and I just, I just, man, I, 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 I'm actually right now. My my wife has asked me to grow my hair out a little bit, and and people in our church are kind of freaking out about it. I've never mentioned it. It's been a year. I've been drawing it out, and it's real awkward. <clears throat> but and people are kind of no whispering. And I heard my, my wife said the other asking questions about your hair. I said, okay. So I'm just not saying anything. But I'm telling you the secret. My wife asked me, and after 42 years of marriage, if my wife says, you want, you know, I think you'd look really sexy with your longer hair again <laughs> at 61. She said, I don't know too many 61ers who can do what you're doing. She said, let's see what it looks like. And if after 42 years, whatever it takes, maybe, you know, I'm, I might keep my word that I told my dad when I was 17. I'm going to grow my hair to my feet when I'm 18 years old. I'm going to grow it long. Anyway, some of you don't know that generation, but that's my dad and I, our biggest arguments in the 70s were going to the barber shop. <laughs> Anybody can relate to that? Anybody? Yeah, okay. A few, a few of us, you know, that was a big deal. And uh, anyway, enough about that. Uh, the point is that God has been transforming his church. The last couple of years, 
He was doing something when we thought he wasn't doing anything. He was doing more than providing. He was changing us. But he wasn't changing us for the sake of change. He was changing us for the sake of mission, for the sake of the purpose that's ahead of us, not to survive, but to thrive and to move forward. And I think there's a lot of people stuck. I think there's a lot of people stuck in the COVID cave. In, you know, I think God's been transforming his church into a loving family and a mighty army at the same time. But we got to get back to our heart for others. See, in that cave, it's very easy to just get selfish. It's all about, we're in survival mode. Hey, hey, yeah, is there a man for himself? No, 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 that's not the kingdom of God. Noah built an ark and said, Whoever, whosoever will can come inside. Get your family in, get the animals in, and nobody else chose to come in. The church is an ark because the world out there is in a storm. And God wants to rescue people because he loves people and he wants to do it right here through this house, through your life. It's true. Like a mighty wind of Pentecost, I believe there's a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit blowing across our land and across our world. And God's work is about to be revealed. A glorious church, a bride without spot or wrinkle, Ephesians 5 says. Lost time may not be lost at all. We may have felt that two and a half years was lost. It's not lost. God's been working. God's been doing something. It may be a deep work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you even feel somewhat discouraged. Maybe even weary. You know, I'll tell you what. I've never been as tired in my ministry life as I was right in the middle. So, so we went from lockdown into racial crisis, and our church is almost half non-white. Our church was the first fully integrated church in our southern community. 1990, we started with a vision to have everybody together in one church, and boy, did we have resistance. And, and the strange part was, I thought the resistance would be from white folks. The resistance was from the black churches, when we first started our church, because they said, no, you can't go to that white church. Well, why is it a white church? Because the, the pastor's white. And they were worried, and now our church ha is, is almost 50%. We have probably 35% African American, probably uh, 18, 15 to 18% Hispanic in our church. We're, we're a, a non-white church with a fairly tan guy. <laughs> it took years to break the spirit of that thing. But it almost all came down after the George Floyd murder. It was a mess. And I've never been so discouraged in my life as people in our own church started attacking each other online and started taking sides in, in a, 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 quite frankly, a, a dumb argument over who matters. Because everybody matters to God, and in order for everybody to matter to God, black folks have to matter to God too. But the problem is, it was Shanghai, that message was shanghai by forces that were trying to steal the argument and shift the church into division mode instead of unity. Where, the, where How good, how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing oil being poured upon the head of the priesthood of Aaron coming down upon the body. And I've never been so discouraged. I'm, I'm, my wife calls me terminally up. I'm not usually a down, I don't usually go through depression. That's not my, that's not my deal. I've, I've had a couple of days of depression in my life. The, the, weird, weirdly, the day I turned 31 was a big deal. 31. Because 30, I had all these promises. And then 30, I was like, I don't think you say anything in the Bible about 30, th turn 31. At 30, Jesus was promoted, David was promoted, Joseph was promoted. 30 was a big deal. 31 was like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> My next birthday, I'll be 62. That's double 31. I'm still going. I mean, <laughs> I, found, I found joy that day, by the way, because Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors. So that was, I said, okay, that's something good. So my wife calls me terminally up, but I'm telling you, when... When the lockdown was going on, and we had it a lot easier in, in Florida than y'all did in some ways, but it was still a challenging moment. And the problem was when we were all working from home, there was no off switch. 
And I think it's probably the same for many of you. If your work is at home and your home is at work, there was, there was, no, there was no more work-life balance. And suddenly we were working all the time and working late into the night and working as soon as we got up in the morning and, that, and, and for months, and that takes a toll. And we usually get a little break in the month of May. The month of May was the height of the lockdown. We didn't get our usual break, and then all of a sudden the whole thing hit and the world went nuts. Add that with other people disgruntled, you know, a handful of people disgruntled in the church. And I, I, don't, I don't know much about the English language, but I don't know anybody that's ever been gruntled. I just know disgruntled. I don't know if gruntled is a word. I, that sounds like it should be something bad, but it's a, if you're a happy person, are you gruntled? I don't know. I've never been gruntled. These are things I think about. Sorry. So, so, we had, you know, so when you get disgruntled people and then people fighting over, you know, we have, we have police officers in our church. We're so, it's, we love our police officers. We honor them. We honor our first responders last week for 9-11. It's a, it's a big, big deal. And yet we had people that were in our leadership that were police officers and people that were in our leadership that were uh, community leaders, uh, African-American leaders, and they all of a sudden were at odds against each other publicly. And I'm like, what is going on? This is the devil. Can we not see this? Thank God we navigated through. We, did, we lost a few families, but it wasn't, it wasn't a major deal. But in my own life, I felt like I was about to have a nervous breakdown. That's what I felt like. And I'd started this book a few months earlier called Unstuck, and I've never been more stuck in my life. I may be, you know, I may be the most qualified person to write a book called Unstuck because I've been stuck more than anybody. But God has always rescued me and showed me the way forward, even if it's an inch or whether it's a step. And he, we navigated all these things by the help of God, by the grace of God. There's a fresh wind, and God is moving. You may be discouraged. You may be weary. That's, you know, Jesus saw the people in his day and said they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd, and he had compassion for them. He, he was touched by their feelings. Maybe you feel like you've been fishing all night, working all the time, and caught nothing, spinning your wheels. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, without a vision, the people perish. Without revealed insights from God, you have nothing. Sideline dreams are about to be switched on again. Maybe there's something God spoke to your heart when you were younger. Maybe you're a young person and you're just getting a hold of something in your heart where you feel like God is calling you to something. You don't know how you're going to get there. You don't know how it's going to happen. I'm just telling you, you have to trust God because God has a process for everything, for every dream that God, now listen, when I talk about dreams, I'm not talking about visions. You know what visions are? Visions are wishful visions. Visions. That's where I wish for something. Oh, I want to be like me. I want to be a, I want to be a famous rock star. <clears throat> well, that didn't happen. But I got something so much better. What I want to be a rock star for was to sing on stage and to, and to, and to, and, and to, Declare something, declare a message. Well, here I am declaring a message on stage. You know, I, I, I want to travel the world. Macedonia will, God, God willing, it'll be my, my 80th country. God promised me 100 countries when I was 25 years old. My wife and I filled the Holy Spirit in the privacy of our own home. And in that time of listening to, listening to God, I felt like God whispered to my heart, you're going to go to at least 100 nations and carry my message. I was in the insurance business. I wasn't a, I wasn't a preacher when he told me that. And I, I, and I said, I said, remember seeing this to God, God, I got no money, I'm not a preacher, and I don't know anybody in the nations, but if you can use me, if that's what you want for me, I'm in, I'm up for it, yes, here am I, send me, here I am, still a young man. Honey, do you, feel, do you think I'm still young? To her, I'm young. That's, it, does, it doesn't matter what you think. If I'm young to her, it's cool. Okay? So, <laughs> I may be having an existential crisis right here. I don't know. <laughs> but at my age, 
I've still got a whole lot of destiny to pursue. And I want to tell you, listen, one of my favorite people in the whole Bible is Caleb, who was still pursuing his destiny at 85 and still had the energy to fulfill his destiny at 85 because that was the call of God. I don't see any 85-year-olds in the room, but there may be a few. And if you're hiding somewhere, it's time to come out of your cave and understand your destiny is still unfolding and your best days are ahead, not behind you. You've got to pursue that. That's unstuck living. That's unstuck living. It's an attitude. I see in my heart pots and pans that have been on the back burner for years being moved by God to the front burner again the front of the stove, God's thing, not a fleshly thing, not you making something happen, but God's saying, I've got those things still ahead of you and your best days are ahead, but it's time. You're gonna have to take those things you were believing for that you set aside, take them off the shelf, take them off the back burner and put them back up front where they belong because God's saying, your timing is coming. And so I wanna finish with this. It's It's time to dare to dream again. You know, the, the, the thought of dream on, I'm not going to lie. The dream on, I was, I, I was looking at a screen, uh, and I saw a, a, a picture of Steven Tyler. And I remembered the, you know, I, I was a big Aerosmith fan back in the day. I've seen them live in London just a few years ago. They're, they're old. I'm not old, but they're old. I mean, Steven Tyler was, like, held together, like, by puppet strings. He was like, you know. But it's a great show. But, but, I, but I, as I saw his picture, and at 75, whatever he is, it's scary. I'm telling you. But as I looked at the picture, I heard God say, dream on. Not dream off. Dream on. This is time to dare to believe God again for the impossible. Signs and wonders and miracles that have been on the back burner are about to be front and center in God's house right here at Metro Church in Marlboro. Right here, when you need a miracle, I believe as we lifted those prayer requests today, God is moving on behalf of those things. Where we're praying, God is moving. Where we're praying, God is moving. He is doing something. But you got to dare to dream again. People are almost afraid to dream of success anymore. That is the enemy. That's a lie from the pit of hell. My wife came with me 10 years ago this week. was the first time I was ever in Metro Church. She was with me. We did some things with Pastor Don and Nita, our dear friends. We had just gotten to meet uh, their kids who we had seen, Pastor Chad and Julie, we had seen them at Wave Conference and didn't even know they were related to the Braswells. We didn't know they were their kids. We'd seen each other for years off and on, and suddenly we started talking about, can I tell them? We started talking about SEC football, Southeastern Conference football at lunch. And Brent and Chad, we just connected. It was like, yes. We almost chest bumped at Longhorn Steakhouse. And it was like this 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 camaraderie, we spoke a language. And then it kind of evolved from something to something. But during that time, so that was now, so that was 2012. 2014, after my precious father-in-law passed away and went to heaven in 2013, my wife began to experience pain in her body, first in her ankle. We thought she sprained her ankle. Until it went into both knees and then it was in both elbows. And within a few months, we were just navigating. Well, what's going on? This is weird. When she couldn't get out of bed one day, a few months later, she said, now my hands hurt. And she showed me her hands. And I, I kid you not, her hands looked like baseball gloves. They were so swollen. And, I, and that, that was the moment. We, you know, everything else, we just prayed. We anointed her with oil. We prayed. We are believing God. And she walked through it. When, we, when I saw those hands, I was like, something's really wrong. And we couldn't get him with a rheumatologist for three months. In that time, she could hardly move. She said, I feel like the tin man in the Wizard of Oz. I can't, I can't move my body. And her body had begun to attack itself in the immune system with rheumatoid arthritis. 
and they told us at the time, when we finally got to the doctor, ironically, he goes, well, I see your address here. He goes, I'm your neighbor. I live two doors down and across the street from you. He said, if only I had known, I could have got you in earlier. And we prayed every day, and I, I wanted to hug him and slap him at the same time. Like, I said, well, you're, you better be glad that we didn't know you were across the street because <laughs> I, I would we would have been at your door in the middle of the night. And he said, you're going to be on these medications the rest of your life and blah, 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 and you're going to get your life back. God began healing her. He never had to do all the, he calls it the nuclear option with these heavy drugs. But he gave these medications. And over the years, she just kept getting better and being healed. But she hadn't been able to travel with me. She has not been on an airplane since before COVID until we flew here to Boston on Friday. And she is here. Now listen, the best part, she's completely healed. She's off all medication, which the doctor said many times, I will never take you off the medication. He's a Jewish doctor and skeptical. He told us at the very beginning when we went in, he said, I don't believe in any of this religious stuff. I don't believe in any of the spiritual stuff. I don't believe in supplement stuff. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor. This is what I'm trained, blah, blah, blah. Last year, a year and a half ago, he said to my wife, you know what? Your levels of inflammation in your body are lower than mine, and I don't have RA. He said, I have no explanation, but I will not call it a miracle. <laughs> but when a Jewish doctor says it's not a miracle, but he has no explanation, you know it's a miracle, right? <laughs> so to God be the glory, she's back with me on the road again, and, uh, and she's completely healed, and she can jump, she can dance, she can shout, she, she kicks the devil in the teeth, she's a prayer warrior, through that time, can I tell you one of the scariest things in my life was seeing my wife unable to get out of bed, unable to move, and wondering if we would ever be the same? But our God is a restorer. He's a restorer. The enemy of your soul is evil and wicked. It wants to stop you, but God wants to heal you. He wants to do something great. When Jesus found Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, they, they weren't just gone fishing. They had given up fishing. They were out of the boat. They had quit fishing, exhausted from working all night, and they had caught nothing, not a, not a fish, not a bite, and that meant no money, no vision. Think about it in reality. We know that at least Peter was a married man because he had a mother-in-law, according to Scripture, that Jesus healed, which means he had a wife that was dependent on him at that time to take care of the household bills and no fishing, and no catching all night, man, he was going to go home and tell his wife, I got nothing for groceries. Come on, let's think of it real terms here. This is not super spiritual Peter yet walking on water. This is a guy who's scared, and he's going to go home and face his wife and say, my work is finished, and I don't know, I don't know what to do. We're, we're mending our nets. We're putting them away. We're licking our wounds. We're discouraged. And along comes Jesus, a carpenter, a master builder, and he gets into Simon's boat, and he speaks a word. Push out. For, now listen, he says first, push out a little from the land, small steps. And then he says, launch out. Everybody say launch out. Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a catch. Launch out into deeper waters. Simon's reaction was strange, but he gave him full surrender. You're the captain now. You're the one. My friends, this is not my first book. I'm about to turn it over to Pastor Chad after I pray for you. But this is not my first book. I wrote a book when I was 32 years old. I had pastored a church for two years, and I thought I knew everything there was to know about pastoring. And my first book was called The New Breed Church, In Your Face. I promise you, that's what it was called. I used to equate boldness with brashness. I no longer equate that. When I reread that book a few years later, I was, wow, I wouldn't say it that way now. And I felt like God said, why don't you wait, son? Why don't you just wait a little bit till you get some life experience before you write something again? Because written, the written word lasts. The written words last longer than the spoken word. You put something in writing, it better be true. Somebody's going to nail you. 
And so this book came out of my heart. I told my wife even back then, I feel like when we're in our 50s or 60s, I'll start writing a, a bunch of books. But I feel there's a hold. And then about November of 2019, right before the pandemic, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I want you to write a book and help others. The big idea is just to help you break free of all the things holding you back from God's best in your life. It's a conversational book. It's not a theological treatise. I have a doctorate in ministry, but I forgot to even put that in the book. In my, in my bio, somebody said, aren't you, don't you have a doctorate? I said, yeah. They said, you forgot to put it in your bio. I said, well, that's, it must not mean as much to me as I thought it used to, you know, because it's not a theological book. It's we're having a conversation together about things that can help you get through this moment into the next moment, things that can get you out of your holding pattern and into your landing zone. I want to empower you to help other people in your family. The book's easy to read. If you can, if you can read C-Spot Run, you can read this book. Okay? New, some of you younger students have no idea what C-Spot Run is, but anyway, it's a classic. The book was just featured in a veiled journal, International Christian Leadership Magazine. And I just, I wish I'd brought enough for every, I, I wish I could give them to you. That's, I, I'm not a book salesman. I'm a steward of a message. That's all. I'm a caretaker of a message God gave me, and I want to help you. But Christmas is coming, and you got a lot of people that don't know how to get unstuck, and you don't know what to buy for them for Christmas because you're stuck on that one. So I'm here to help you in many ways. Before we give it back to Pastor Chad, would you bow your head and close your eyes? I just want to tell you how honored I am, my wife and I, to be here, to be with you, to have this relationship we appreciate you so much. We pray for this church often because we love you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person here and every person connecting with us online. I pray that you would move in this room, Holy Spirit. Awaken those dusty dreams. We call forth now. We speak to the promises of God that are dormant inside of them. We speak to the, I want you, everybody put your hand on your belly for a moment. Put your hand on your stomach. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I speak a release to those dreams and gifts and callings and destiny and purpose moments. Be stirred in the name of Jesus and come forth now. Come forth now. God dreams, not carnal dreams, not, not fleshly visions of fame and fortune, but promises of God from the Word of God. Be stirred inside of every person. For your Word says when we agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done. The greatest part of dream, keeping your dreams, get your dream going is this. If you're trying to do it outside of Jesus, it's impossible. That's just more carnality, more selfishness. But if you're here today, let me tell you, the greatest step, one, toward dream realization is accepting Jesus Christ, asking him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, having a relationship with him, not a religious thing, not a head knowledge, but a heart experience. If you're here today, you know if you've been living for God. You know if you've been living one, one foot in the church and one foot in the world. It's time to surrender. It's time to say, Jesus, please get on my boat. Be the captain. Be the captain of my boat. Because I feel like I've been working all night and I'm exhausted and I'm defeated. But I know you have a new day for me. At your word. I will launch out. If that's you, whether you're here at home, there's always a corresponding action to faith. I worked for years with Benny Hinn. That's how I started in ministry in the 80s. And whenever somebody would have a miracle, he'd do what Jesus did. He'd say, do something you couldn't do before. I would just say this. If you're here today and you say, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life, or I want to quit playing games and fully connect and commit, 
I want you to, without thinking about it, put your hand up in the air right now, as high as you can, and say, I want somebody to pray for me. I need prayer. I need Jesus. I need God in a different way. I need God on the front burner, not in the back. I don't want to play games. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I need God. There's hands going up all over the place. Lord, I pray for every person whose hand is raised, every person whose heart is open, that you reveal Jesus in a brand new and fresh way of surrender. Be blessed and open your heart. Everybody, everybody with your hands up and everybody that's, that's, that's in agreement, just say this out loud. Just say, Jesus, come into me, my dream releaser. Fill me up and let my life be filled with your purpose all of my days. I give you the helm of my boat. Lead me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come on, can we give? Come on, can we give a huge hand for all those people that made that decision? There's nothing better than getting right with Jesus. You know, the Bible says that when one person makes that decision, you know, this church, we know that all of heaven parties. That's what the scripture says. And so there is a party going on. And I'm so thankful that we got to be a part of that this morning. You know, one of the things that I do know is that when it comes to walking out our faith, we have to be obedient to God's scripture. We have talked about that all the time. And one of the things that we believe is that when we read in the scripture, when it comes to God's tithe and his offering, that those are his. How many understand that? And so some people say, well, what kind of church is this? There's all these crazy lights, and clearly they bring crazy people up here to speak. And, you know, did anyone else notice he looks like John Travolta? I'm just saying. <laughs> you Google John Travolta swordfish, and you'll be surprised. <laughs> but what I'll tell you is when it comes to God's Word, we, we may be a, a, a church that really pushes the envelope on modern, but when it comes to the Scripture, we believe the Scripture is timeless. And so what that means is we believe that when it comes to God's tithe and his offering, that we are supposed to bring it back into the local storehouse. What does that mean? God, you've given me 100% of everything I have, and I'm going to be obedient and bring the tithe, the first 10% back to you with an offering. And so as a church, we have an opportunity right now where we can do that through uh, online. Also, there are generosity drop boxes here to continue to be obedient. But what I will say is this is a very special Sunday, and if you've been around Metro Church for any period of time, you know that we understand a laborer is worth his wage, and we understand we need to receive a prophet and with prophet's honor as well. And so we are going to bless pastors uh, Richard and Gail Perrin, chief. They didn't come for it, but what? We won't let them leave without it. And so if you're going to be giving today with your tithe and offering, you can do that all through, uh, you know, either the website or the app or the envelopes there. But there is a guest speaker thing that we would love to just bless them. How many know that you sow in to fertile soil if you want a good harvest. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Well, how many think that sowing into the ministry of what is going to be almost 80 countries now around the world would be a good place to sow some seed? And so I would just love for you to be a part of us as we bless them. And we love you guys so much. We really do. You're part of our family. And we're thankful for the God uh, providential connections. And so, uh, church, we're going to receive the offering. Uh, but first, let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your goodness in our life. We know that everything we have is because of you. We may have worked for it, but it's only with the gifts and talents you first gave us, Lord God. And so we bring your tithe and your offering back to you. We pray that you'd bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Thank you again for being with us today. We hope you were both encouraged and challenged by that powerful message. 
If you made a decision to follow Christ, we want to say congratulations. And here's how we can help. First, email us at info at metrochurch.tv, letting us know you made that decision. And we'll send you this free book called What on Earth Am I Here For?, which talks about the purpose and vision that God has for your life. If you're with us in person, this book will also be available in the seat back in front of you. Our church office will also send you some information on our Dive In class, which is a four-week series offered here at Metro Church. If you missed the beginning of this service and would still like to participate in giving, you can do so through our website. There are also generosity boxes available by the exit doors. For those of you who joined us for the first time today, make sure to pick up a blue gift bag on your way out. In that gift bag, you will find an information card that we'd love for you to fill out and return to our info desk. For every card that we receive, we will donate $10 to an orphanage that we support in Zimbabwe. In exchange for your information card, we will also give you a voucher for you and your party to receive a free beverage in our Metro Cafe. If you need prayer for anything, please email info at metrochurch.tv. We would love to pray and believe with you. Thank you again for being with us today. We love you, Metro Church family, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.